You're listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Vuelta a España in association with Rafa. Celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Today we are in Guisan Gran Narbonne. Where are we, Lionel? Where are we? We're in Grisson, which is on the coast in the southwest of France. We're just turning the corner towards Spain now. I think we needed a bit of pronunciation police on our uh, Spanish uh, opener there. Uh, the girl who's doing <laughs> done our Spanish jingles. Oh, did she... Um it's a slightly dodgy pronunciation. Well, you know, I mean, people not speaking their first language, that's forgivable. It is completely forgivable. And her pronunciation of the, the Spanish places that we're going to, and we're going to quite a few of those, <laughs> is impeccable. Excellent. Well, where we are, Grisson here, is uh, well, the wind is really blowing hard out there. We're right on the coast. This is an area where they're the salt pans. They're not quite here. They're just a, behind that bit of hill there. So that's where you can you could go and scoop up yourself a bit of salt to take home rich if you wanted also the oyster farming that's another big thing here oysters not a, i'm not a big fan of oysters what about you, you no, fran yeah i do like oysters uh, although i can afford them normally so well on your cycling podcast wage you can go and get yourself uh, a Fill big your boots. bag yeah. big bag of oysters uh, i should have said well i should introduce well, us we should shouldn't we yes yeah, yeah i'm richard moore that's lionel burney uh <laughs> warbling away about oysters <laughs> and and Fran Reis, Julio Iglesias has joined us again tonight as he will every night throughout the Vuelta Fran yeah. um, we, today was our first day in the car with Fran and we were treated to some of his Spanish music weren't we? We were I noticed one very uh, popular Spanish band from Newcastle Dire Straits <laughs> they were on quite a bit <laughs> Very yeah. popular in Spain, are they? Uh, well, not actually, but they are popular at my place. So oh. you enjoy Manolo Garcia? Um, well, I nodded off a bit in the back, so I had a small siesta in the, yeah. in the middle of the afternoon, so I missed out on that. But I'm sure we've got another couple of days in your car, Fran, before yeah. we pick up our own car. Um, so I'm sure we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, um, we'll get to grips with uh, what you're playing. It's b- certainly better than Radio Richard that gets played at the Tour de France. Hmm. Sorry. Anyway. Tale of the Tapa, please, Lionel. Well, yeah, I was just oh, going to say, uh, before Something we move on from Grisson, because if you're of my vintage, if you're a student of any kind in the 1990s, you will probably have had a poster from Betty Blue on your wall. Richard, did you? Nope. Ah, did you have Ned's Atomic Dustbin instead? It was nope. a choice between the two, I think. Oh, no, um, just <laughs> <laughs> it was all Morrissey and Robert Miller in my bedroom. Oh, a late bid for credibility there from Richard Moore. Um, well, Betty Blue, a lot of the scenes were filmed down here. It's set here. Um, so when you... Well, not actually this part here, more round the corner where the where Grisson Plage is, just on the beach. So that's our wrap-up of Grisson. Um, let's talk about stage two of the Vuelta from Nîmes, 203 kilometres. Fairly rapid today, but... N- well, not in speed terms, but not in terms of uh, action. There was, a, there, was, there was zero breakaways in today's stage. That's the sort of comment that if, when writers hear it or see it written down, they just get so <laughs> exasperated by Because yeah. speaking to a few at the finish, they had the most horrendous, horrific day out there today. I mean, I was at the Aqua Blue bus and the lang- the, the air was, was blue. Or is it purple? Is that the expression? I can't remember. But um, anyway, there was a lot of kind of, oh my, you know, that was that was awful. That was brutal. And there Lionel just dismisses it as a, just a run-of-the-mill day at the office. Well, I put my foot in it at the Cannondale bus by asking... Lionel was snoozing in the car, of course. <laughs> this makes it worse, but I did put my foot in it in a similar fashion at the Cannondale bus because Simon Clark came back and said, uh, all right, mate, and I was, all right, you know, how come it didn't split up in the wind? And he said, well, because it was 70k an hour at times. <laughs> how come you didn't get in a break? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're guilty, aren't we, on days like this of just thinking it's been an easy day, but just imagine the scrabbling for wheels and... You know, the change of direction, um, the, the roundabouts, so many roundabouts on the course mm. today. Um, 85. 85? 85, wow. actually. Well, there we are. And, um, well, anyway, the stage might not have been eventful from w- watching it from a distance, but um, there was a little bit of change overall because Quick Step, they were, they played a, a well, they played it perfectly because they targeted the intermediate sprint, which came quite late in the stage at 174 kilometres. 
uh, Matteo Trentin won it and he took a three second time bonus there. He was only six seconds down on Rowan Dennis, the race leader this morning. So that was edging him closer and their plan was to try and win the stage, obviously with Trentin, because as we know, Richard, he's a very good bunch sprinter. Um, <laughs> anyway, there was a bit of a Lucas Pustelberger moment at the finish. If you remember the opening stage of the Giro d'Italia when the Bora Hansgro rider was trying to do the lead out, um, but basically clipped off the front in the finale. A similar thing happened here and Yves Lampert won Guido Guido Trentin no that's a rider from oh. about 20 years ago Mat- Matteo Trentin was second his teammate of course quick step floors rider Adam Blythe uh, who was t- who tipped himself to win today finished third overall Lampert now leads his teammate Trentin by a second Daniel Oss of BMC is at three seconds a few little splits just behind um, the significant names in the, the first split, Chris Froome, Fabio Aru, Rafael Maika, Carlos Betancourt, Adam Yates, Domenico Pozzovivo, Wilco Kelderman, and these riders, Roman Bardet, Warren Barguil, Ilnu Zakarin, Alberto Contador, and Simon Yates, all lost five seconds to that first group of riders. Tomorrow we go to Andorra. There are two first category climbs and a second category climb, and we'll probably see a lot more shaking up in the race for the red jersey. Yeah, it's similar to stage three of the Giro, when, uh, again, quick step, that the masters in these conditions really split, split the race up in the finale. Uh, the beneficiary that day, I think, uh, Bob Jungels. I mean, he didn't. Gaviria won the stage, didn't he? But Bob Jungels took the pink jersey, didn't he? If memory serves correctly, I thought he'd be the guy really driving it today. He perhaps was at, at points, but he lost a bit of time. Um, and Eve Lampart, the big tractor fan, um, not an ex-tractor fan. <laughs> he is. Uh, that wasn't oh. that. That joke just came to me. He is. He is a big. He's a huge fan of of tractors. Well, when he won Dwarz de Flanderen in the spring, uh, which I was at, if you want to listen to the Lionel of Flanders, my week at those spring classics, probably not the time of year for that, but sign up as a friend of the podcast and you can listen to those episodes. But Yves Lampert won that race and the following day, this is so Belgian. He was There was a massive picture of him on a tractor in one of the Belgian newspapers and it was like, that's how the Belgians celebrate winning a bike race. I can't think of a better way to celebrate winning a bike race. Anyway, he is the new, the new leader of... Of, of the race going into tomorrow's quite interesting stage with uh, in, into Andorra with those climbs you say not we'll talk a bit about that in the final part but Lionel at the finish you spoke to one of the quick step sports directors I did uh, Geert van Bont who has joined the team I think joined the team earlier this at the start of this year but um, you may know him as a winner of Gimp Wevelgem way back when um, and was a sports director at Garmin Canada when they were called Garmin Canada and uh, yeah because of this quick step one two this evening I wanted to ask what the plan was obviously they wanted to uh, go for the sprint but what I hadn't realized was that their initial target was in fact the red jersey well the plan was if we had the chance go for a bonus sprint with uh, Matteo so we knew if it took three seconds then he had to be top three to take the jersey so the jersey was actually the the main goal and also of course the victory but would give him a little bit less pressure than to win so then we saw it was the ideal scenario uh, when everything was still together so he took three seconds and then of course we said 2.5k to go on the roundabout that would be crucial so we lined up the guys uh, on the meeting in the morning to say okay that's going to be the the point where we have to maybe try to do something but apparently it went better than than, than we thought because uh, the plan was towards the last k that bob would uh, take in that position the first position and then the lead out by Eve and then to uh, Matteo for the sprints but then apparently Eve was so strong he was alone so uh, Matteo could relax of course and Os had to do the work to catch him back so um, yeah Eve stayed in front and Matteo uh, finished second so a little bit like the first road stage of the Giro when Lucas Postelberger was supposed to be doing the lead out but it went better than planned for him the same kind of thing happened here Yes, um, I think that was a little bit different because we were with four or five guys in the front and then uh, at one moment I think they were just riding so fast and then you see Eve at one moment he's alone and then yeah, of course if we were with four guys and then maybe the rest hesitate a little bit so we they could relax a little bit more especially with Matteo so um, yeah, I think it was a little bit different but maybe on the same uh, on the same way maybe. And lastly, it's been very windy but what was the, what direction was the wind coming from? Because there weren't any splits, there weren't any really, I mean it was nervous, but there weren't any times when people were put under real pressure in the wind. Yeah, I think all the day was pretty pretty nervous. Um, 
especially uh, towards the coast um, with narrowing and uh, so we had two parts so it was always like fast and not fast and uh, riders were dropped and coming back but of course it was always long way towards the finish line so um, I think it's also still 20 days to go so it was all the day nervous but not as nervous to make uh, to make so many uh, to make some splits so that was Geert van Bont, the sports director at Quickstep, one of many sports directors at Quickstep. And uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, it's what we expect from Quickstep, isn't it, in these conditions? I mean, we were struck, obviously, by the wind in Nîmes this morning. Very, very strong indeed. And perhaps might have expected a little bit more from the GC teams. But Fran, you were you noticed Sky having a, a real go about 10 kilometers to go. Yeah, it was not like the latest crucial turn the latest moment where the race could split and then Sky took the responsibility to hit and it actually create, did some harm the peloton split uh, quite quickly they stopped pulling but Astana took on and then it was when quick step got to the front of the bunch to pull and make the gaps that arrived to the finish line the Rafa Cycling Club is the largest global community of its kind Members share their passion for the road through rides, events, exclusive club kits and racing. Find out more at rafa.cc. Thank you to Rafa, our headline sponsor. We're very grateful, of course, to them. A little reminder that the Rafa Nocturne was held in Copenhagen on Saturday evening. First time that's ever happened. It's been held in London for a few years. And uh, the winners were Graham Briggs of the men's race and Ricky Lon, the local rider in uh, the women's race. Uh, that's the sort of inaugural uh, Rafa Nocturne World Series. Just two events this year, but it's expanding. Next year, quite exciting. The plan's not announced yet to go to iconic cities, I think I can say. Uh, well, Copenhagen is basically the home of the bicycle. I mean, if you've ever been, been there, everybody rides a bike. It's a fantastic uh, place to get, well, people use it just to get around, don't they? I mean, it's probably one of the most bike-friendly cities in Europe. Another reason to be excited about Rafa, well, certainly for Fran, we presented Fran with his official cycling podcast, Rafa Jacket. doesn't look like it's gonna be, going to be cold enough for you to wear that We're here praying. on well. Fran is praying but for cold I, I am so proud of that jacket that I am going to wear it as much as I can, you know? Even if that means losing some time, I am ready to make that sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> so if you see a, a, a Spanish man melting wearing his uh, Rafa jacket in 45 degree heat at this Welter, then you'll know that that is Fran Reyes, our uh, new signing here uh, for this year's Welter. What's yeah. next, Richard? We need to talk a little bit more about stage two. You mentioned Vincenzo Nibali, uh, who we've not talked about, who uh, is a sort of dark horse, I suppose. Everybody's talking about Chris Froome as an outstanding favourite. Nibali, you know, has been flying below the radar. You could almost say he's been sort of just coasting on the the the, foot, the the bed of the sea like a like a shark waiting to oh. waiting to attack. Lionel is surprised you didn't mention it in your tale of the tapa because the, the, one of the rides of the day really. I mean the the ride of the day by a, a GC rider certainly. He was tenth on the stage, you know, on a on a on a, on a, a hard finish like that, a fast finish like that, and he gained well he gained eight seconds on Chris Froome and and more on a lot of his other rivals. I mean Chavez Esteban Chavez was also impressive, but he was in that. He was in a little group just ahead of Chris Froome, just behind Nibali. I'll hold my hands up there. I miss Nibali out. And when you think he is on paper the second favourite for this race, um, it just shows, doesn't it, that you kind of... That you're not paying attention. Well, I'm not paying attention. I have to thank Fran for pointing it out on the results as we were just preparing to record here. Um, but Nibali is kind of... He's such a slow burner, isn't he? he he's... he's We've seen in the, in the Giro in the last couple of years, you know, him coming so strong in the final week. So I really don't start paying attention to Vincenzo Nibali until after the second rest day. You know, in the pre-race press conference, Alberto Contador made exactly that point that Vincenzo Nibali was for sure the rider who was better prepared for the Vuelta a España because of his expertise, because of how good he knows himself. But he had a little setback today because he lost... One important domestic, Javi Moreno, local rider, that knows perfectly all the stages on the south of Spain. He suffered a hard crash, which involved also Anas Ait Al Abdia, a Moroccan rider who also had to pull out of the race. I talked to the Bahrain Merida uh, press officer, Geoffrey Pizzorni, and he told me that Javi had hit heavily his jaw 
And as the time that we are talking, uh, there was not an official press release still released, but he was in hospital being examined to determine the reach of his injury. He, he's had terrible luck this year, hasn't he? Because he was disqualified. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't know if this qualifies as bad luck, but he was disqualified from the Giro on stage five, was it? To Etna, the, the so er, early stage four, stage five, can't remember. Stage four, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, and um, he was disqualified for lashing out at Diego Rosa. Um, so he was sent home early from, from the Giro and he's, he's gone home very early from the Vuelta. So not, not the best of uh, seasons for him. El Abdia, you said his name very well, the, the Moroccan rider. A real shame for him, 24 years old, um, his first Grand Tour. Um, he stepped up this year and, and yet to see him go home on the second day. He's somebody who um, would earmark to think to go and speak to one day and find out a bit more about and uh, that's a real pity for him. Yeah, when you look at Bahrain Merida, I mean Moreno is one of the real, you know, I mean he's he's second in command really for Nibali so that, that would be a big loss <laughs> uh, if he's unable to continue. Not not well, confirmed yet. That no, he's, no, he's no, not. He's definitely pulled out. I mean, right. I mean Lionel, you, you've got to start. We're gonna we're gonna have to start waking up, Lionel. I think I'm in, gonna, the, in well, the back of the car. So, yeah. so are you are you here, are you here to work or are you on holiday, Lionel? You keep saying you're on holiday. This is the holiday grand tour for me, <laughs> oh, so I'm only oh, I'm yeah. only looking. Yeah, come back, Daniel Freib. <laughs> Daniel unfortunately can't join us. He's got a bit of a drive, but um. I think we will be looking to maybe make a tactical substitution. Uh, maybe put you on the bench That's tomorrow fine. night. That's fine. I'll snooze in the back of the car tomorrow <laughs> on the and bench. Tuesday. Fine. We are going to do with him the same thing that Javi Moreno did with Diego Rosa <laughs> at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but with no, uh, no equivalent penalty. Um, anyway, the other talking point today, you mentioned this in your tail the etapa line well done uh, <laughs> as, I've, as I've always maintained I'm aiming for 60% accuracy Adam okay. Blythe Adam, Adam Blythe uh, did back himself to, to win today um, a few might have scoffed at that but you have to say well, well done Adam Blythe I mean he got right up there he was the third best of the rest had it come down to a conventional sprint yeah, he might he might well have won the stage I mean he was he was very very close indeed um, rode really well all day as did his team in the final well, they, they I was going to say yeah, yeah. Set up. They, they did what you would expect a, a seasoned team to do and they're making their Grand Tour debut all, all day on a difficult day with, with the wins the way they were with, with splits threatening and happening at various points um, he was up near the front the whole time every time I looked it was Mark Christian looking after him all day uh, until Aaron Gate took over in the, in the finale but a, a very impressive performance from them on their second day in a Grand Tour and this is a perfect opportunity to um, remind you that Aqua Blue are the subject of our first Kilometre Zero which comes out tomorrow Monday morning um, and for the first time well it's the first time we're doing Kilometre Zero at the Vuelta it's the first time also that Kilometre Zero is for friends of the podcast so if you've signed up as a friend of the podcast you will get that on your friends feed which you can get on your smartphone or wherever you want it but if you want to become a friend of the podcast go to the cyclingpodcast.com and it costs 10 pounds for the year and as well as come to zero here at the Vuelta you'll be able to listen to all the special episodes that we've produced this year yeah I think we've done nine or eight or nine of them so far yeah and they're sort of documentary length feature length episodes looking at various aspects and things in the sport the most recent one was my day in the Cannondale Drapac team car at the Tour de France so um, do go to thecyclingpodcast.com and uh, become a friend of the podcast Listen to Kilometer Zero, our morning show at the Vuelta España, by becoming a friend of the Cycling Podcast at thecyclingpodcast.com. We don't have a lot of people, staff-wise, who've been to Grand Tour before, so I think it was that whole build-up. I mean, we knew we got the Vuelta invite, you know, months ago, and I think it just snuck up on us because we were so focused on the next race, next race. Then we realised we were we were here, and we have a special project here. I mean, the whole idea behind that new sport is is this sustainability. And what we've developed here is this real culture of togetherness. And I think the staff, they don't see it as jobs. They really feel it for the riders. They're almost, they want the best for them. So I think that brings a level of excitement and a level of nervousness for the riders as well. So but I, think, I, think it, I think it breeds well. It's, it's good for the guys. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it, was pretty, it was pretty special today. So there was a little teaser for our first Kilometre Zero on Aqua Blue. Spoke to a lot of the, the riders and staff. And, you know, a fascinating story. 
um, and it'll be really interesting to see how they get on. At the finish today, I spoke to Mark Christian, who I've spoken to every day. He's making his Grand Tour debut, of course. Young British rider. Well, he's from the Isle of Man, isn't he? Like so many. And he did, a, as I mentioned earlier, a great job for Adam Blythe today. Here's what he said at the finish. Every time I look to the screen, you seem to be right up at the front. Your job was obviously to look after Adam today. Yeah, exactly that. Um, yeah, we knew he had a great chance at the end there. Um, but yeah, we um, it was frantic. Like the, the wind, oh, it was a nervous day all day with that wind. Um, so like, right at the end, it was just like all about keeping Adam in the right position, keeping him out of trouble. Um, we were just missing like maybe one or two guards at the last bit, but I just did everything I could to get him to this uh, to the climb of five k's to go. Um, and then I sort of left him and Aaron to it, then just off, off the other side to do the last couple of k. How was it? I mean, it, it was obviously windy. It was fast. Um, there were no breaks. Did that? How, how did that affect? things back in the bunch it just made it nervous like all day everyone was like fighting for position because no one's ever sure exactly when it can go off it could happen any time and like the direction of the stage it was like a to b and it was in one direction all day so it was pretty much going to be there's a chance for it to split any time um, everyone is aware of that and uh, it just sort of makes everyone fight for position even though not it's kind of like just in case something's going to happen so um, you know, sometimes it's like one direct point where it's like one massive fight, you get to that point and it's done. But there, it's like everyone's just on edge all the time, just in case. So they're not really enjoyable stages, them, to be honest. But, um, you know, just glad to get to the finish and stick Adam in a decent enough position to have a shot. How did you find, I mean, your first road stage in a, in a Grand Tour obviously had this important job to do. How, 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 how did you find that? How, how did the other teams, did they let you do the job that you were there to do, which was to keep Adam up near the front? as long as you're not riding like an idiot like you know you get respect off these guys you know like respect is like goes in two ways and I think that they respect that we're trying to just do our job as well as they are um, you know I think the only difference when you come to races like this you race team race against these teams all year round but when you come to these slow level of races it's like they're nine get best riders you know or you know nine of the best you know everyone sends like the strong teams here so you know I think um, although the level of the race is so high the standard here is really really high it's like um you know, we're just getting on with doing our jobs as well as we can. And a third for Adam, he's a bit frustrated, I think, but, you know, you can hold your heads up high after that, I would think. Definitely. I mean, he's going to look back and probably be pretty happy with it, but we came here to win, you know, and, and he did as well. You know, he's a winner as, as well, himself. Uh, you know, he's a real racer. So he's always going to be disappointed to not win, with, you know, coming in with high hopes, but he's going to have more chances along the rest of the race as well. It's not the only sprint, so, you know, we'll try again. So that was Mark Christian. Uh, I think he was happier than Adam Blythe. Adam Blythe was was a bit frustrated because he, he saw how close the win was but you know I think he can be happy I think when he reflects on it he'll be happy and certainly the team the team will be very happy impressive to get a third place uh, on your first road stage in a Grand Tour yeah and I think there's an opportunity in a couple of days time isn't there I mean there aren't many well, yeah, I mean as the race goes on it gets very hilly doesn't it but I think in a couple of days time there might be another opportunity and if Aqua Blue are going to do something they probably need to do it in the first half of the race before it really starts to take its toll they've got quite a few um, riders riding their first Grand Tour and uh, yeah you, but you never know I mean there's n it's not like there's a huge list of sprinters they could certainly you know feel confident that Adam Blythe might be able to pull something off. Absolutely. And at the finish, uh, Fran, you spoke to Jaroslav Popovic, the sports director at Trek Segafredo. Actually, to tell it exactly like that happened. At the finish line, I saw Diego Rubio, the Spanish rider for Caja Rural, specialist on breakaways in flat terrain, and asked him, man, why didn't you go on any breakaway? And then he, told, he explained to me that at the very first period of the stage, the Trek Segafredo team tried to set up some crosswinds. They actually launched an attack. So, obviously, I went back uh, to the Trek Segafredo camp and spoke to the sports director of the team, Jaroslav Popovic, who explained to me that they were actually keen to attack in order to, you know, hit first. So, I've been told that you launched your first try of Echel just in the start of the race. How come? As was, you know, everybody knows it was a really difficult stage with the wind. We expect more wind all, st all stage, but in the middle it was almost no windy, also not, not good for the, for the restaurant, but we say to our guys to stay always in the front for this, it was already perfect, because nobody knows what will happen. It's better to start first if after they follow the other riders. Yeah, rather hit first and ask it later. Yeah, but this was not from the car, it's coming from the riders because always people thinking we, we need to give a lot of advice or everything. We we give all the information for our riders after 
riders need to decide in the peloton what 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 do. Yeah, exactly. After all, you have pretty good ride captains here. Yeah, 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 for sure. We also, I, I well, how I said bef say before, it will be better to move and try to do something or stay there in the front and if we do follow after all day behind. Yeah, what was interesting is the situation that it created because the race was more or less blocked for the two hours of race with all the GC teams standing in the front of the peloton with a very high speed. But it's, it's normal because, it's, uh, you know, I, I say everybody was care about the win. Nobody tried to go in the breakaway for sure someone, but this was not possible. It was like a little bit different crazy stage. Yeah. For sure we expect more, more fighting, but this was split only in the last 10k or 12k. It's, like this is good <laughs> because today was, was can be also if it will be more split before mm -hmm. somebody can lose already the Vuelta here. After all, for you the yeah, race is okay, race yeah. is even. Yeah, after yeah, all, yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, interesting, Fran. There that Trek Segafredo were trying to split it. Obviously trying to put Sky on the back foot, trying to make life difficult for Chris Froome. So everyone obviously had the same idea, but just the, it comes down solely to the, the direction of the road, the direction of the wind, and whether there's any shelter. There were some quite tree-lined bits, and you just never know. I mean, they're, they're waiting for the opportunity to go hard on one side of the road, push everybody else across the other side of the road because the wind's blowing them all there and, and then see if the splits happen. But, you know, if, as Simon Clark and others have said, it was it was hard and fast anyway, you know, the opportunities, the window of opportunity narrows a bit. And, and you know, we anticipated it, but it didn't happen. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you to Science and Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast and a reminder that you can get 20% off all your Science Sport products at sciencesport.com with the code CPAUG20. So thank you very much to them. We will be hearing more nutrition, sports nutrition themed features during this Vuelta as we've heard at the Giro and the Tour de France. So I'm not sure what days they'll be played, but um, stand by for them. One of them will be with Hayden Groves actually, who is a Science and Sport ambassador and is riding the Vuelta one day ahead of the race, as he did at the Giro and the Tour de France. Um, quite, quite a remarkable story. Um, so listen, what else today, chaps? You, Lionel, spoke to friend of the podcast, <laughs> Patrick Lefebvre, at the start. Mm. We haven't got Daniel today to mispronounce his name. We haven't, have we? We had the pronunciation police all set up to make an arrest. Patrick Lefebvre. Lefebvre. Yes, Rich, it's been a very quick, steppy day. I spoke to Patrick Lefebvre this morning because they, well, they're going to look quite different next year, aren't they? Tom Bonin, of course, has already retired, so they've lost their kind of uh, big cobble classics rider. They've still got Philippe Joubert, of course. They've lost Marcel Kittel, who's gone to Katusha, and they have lost Daniel Martin, who's going to UAE Team Emirates. And that's quite a lot of talent to try to replace. And I wondered, Patrick Lefebvre has had the problem of whether or not quick step Floors was going to carry on as the sponsor. We still don't know the full picture regarding the sponsorship of the team officially. Um, we do know they're continuing, they're signing riders. But I started by asking Patrick whether he was concerned that it was going to be all change there next year. Patrick, your team is going to look very different next year. How do you feel about that? I like difference. It's not nice to eat every day the same plate, no? <laughs> But you had two of the star riders of the Tour de France, Daniel Martin and Marcel Kittel, and both are moving on to different teams. Are you, are you worried? Do you have some gaps to fill? Do you have any other riders that you're going to announce before uh, December the 31st? I think if you follow a little bit with my team, I did a lot of investment in young people in the last years, and uh, these people are growing. And uh, with Philippe Gilbert, uh, Ala Philippe, uh, uh, Bob Chungus, Henrik Maas, I think... Uh, Gaviria, Viviani, and now the young Dutch sprinter Jakobsen. I'm, I'm not worried. What about Daniel Martin? Because he had a very good Tour de France. Um, did you try to keep him? No. Were there any contract negotiations with him at all? None. So you were happy for him to move on? And uh... yeah, I'm always happy if somebody takes the double that he has today. So I'm a bookkeeper, you know. I know very much how, many, how much money I have and what I can spend. If somebody comes tell me that uh, another team pays the double, then I say goodbye and good luck. And what about Marcel Kittel? Um, he's obviously had all those tour stage wins. 
it will be different next year, but Gaviria is coming up very fast. W will we expect to see him in the Tour next year? Yeah, and uh, he has only one goal, to beat Kittel mm -hmm. and the others. <laughs> That's not about Gaviria Kittel. And just on this race, what ambitions do you have here? We are here to, to win stages and to try, uh, if it's possible, maybe David La Cruz in the classification. He did by surprise last year, and now it's maybe the time to, to confirm. He's leaving as well, isn't he? Um, how is it when you have a rider as your, your overall contender when you know he's leaving? We take others then. I'm not very worried about riders coming and going. This is world, that's cycling. For me, I'm more worried about my structure. I, it, it hurts me more if uh, a soigneur who works 10 years with me or a mechanic uh, goes because this is, uh, there are my people who are fixed in the team and who are important. And riders, they have a contract, uh, they have agents. An agent wants to earn money. So if he can sell the rider for more money, he earns money. And we have to live with it. Lastly, Enrique Mas was very impressive in the Tour of Burgos recently. I knew very little about him. What can you tell me? Where did you find him and what kind of rider do you expect him to be in this race? I find him on the road, of course. <laughs> Uh, I'm following very good young people and I have uh, probably one of the only teams in the world I have a, f a, a professional full-time scout in the team and he did a good job if you have uh, if you look back on the internet and you look about uh, the Clan Constantia team and the Ignit Itix team what we did in four years so many riders became professional in our team and other teams then you will understand that we did a good job I agree with Patrick Lefebvre there, really, because teams that have been around a long time, naturally they evolve. I know there's a lot of interest and excitement about the transfer window at this time of the season. Um, but, you know, for the, from the riders' point of view, they are just moving on and wearing a different jersey and settling into another team. It doesn't make a huge dif amount of difference to us as, as, as observers, does it? I suppose it? I suppose it does once the season gets underway. But, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, Quickstep are going to be fine, aren't they? They've got a conveyor belt of talent coming through, one of whom... Uh, the Spanish rider Enrique Mas, who was second at the Vuelta a Burgos uh, earlier on this month. Uh, a brand new name for me, and Patrick Lefebvre there put me in my place. Where did you spot him? On the road. Well, thank you, Patrick. Um, but <laughs> Fran, do you, uh, do you know much about him? He's a young Spanish guy, only 22 years of age. Last year, rode for Quickstep Floors development team, Klein Constantia. Uh, you mentioned, Fran, that Guy van Bont had been a sports director there. So, you know, things start to, the picture starts to build. They've obviously got, um, you know, a great talent identification staff at, at Quickstep Floors. And Lefebvre said, you know, he has a full-time scout who's watching junior and under 23 races. Um, but Enrique Mas is here. It's his first Grand Tour, is it? Before addressing Mas, do you know who that scout is? I don't. Jose and Fernandez Machin, former DS of the Lampre team and uh, Geox CMG and Saunier Duval. And uh, yeah, he actually has quite an eye to spot talent and quite a mouth to attract it. <laughs> about Enrique Mas, um, he was one of the best Spanish prospects since early on. You know, I remember his first under 23 race, he contended as a junior actually, uh, being 17 years old against people from up to 26 years old, and he was second. You know, that was his first show of talent. Hang on, what were, what were 25 year olds doing riding an under 23 race? Well, at the under 23 amateur, more or less it's the same Spain. I, I, don't, I don't know. Please don't mess with me, Richard, okay? <laughs> Sorry to pull you up on that point. <laughs> Very relaxed about age categories in Spain, are they? Yeah, and, and you know who won that race also? I don't, I'm afraid I don't know because I don't even know what the race was. So you're asking a lot of me. Arkites Durang. That, that's name, ring a bell for you guys? This guy was the first junior. I think you can tell by our silence. Eh? You can tell by our silence. Yeah. This guy was the first Spanish junior rider to make it to the pro ranks straight away without even stepping a foot in the under 33 category. And he went to the pro ranks with Jose and Fernandez Machin riding for the Saunier Duval team. But, well, he fell to deliver on his promise and had a, and his first child being 20 years old, so his head was kind of a mess. But, well, 
further uh, away from that story about Enrique Mas. He was soon recruited by Alberto Contador's foundation, the one that is setting now continental development team for Trek Segafredo. But he only spent there a couple of years before he was recruited by Machin for the Klein Constantia team. He's a pretty nice climber, he's very punchy, and he has, de uh, he has developed very quickly, which is quite unusual in a Spanish rider, since here in this country, riders tend to develop very slowly and only reach their maturity at maybe 30 years old. And, you know, now that we are talking also about relations and families, do you know who his cousin is? Oh, no, I hate this. He's just, he's just going <laughs> to throw, throw these questions at us all well, doesn't it? Uh, no. He, his cousin is Tony Colom. Former uh, Astana and Katusha rider who tested positive in a Paris, I think it was, or Dauphine maybe, after helping Binokur of land some impressive victories. That's his cousin, mentor and trainer. Wow, well, that's interesting, isn't it? Well, he might want to keep that a little bit quiet. Well, perhaps, it's difficult, no. Enrique Mas. But uh, as impressive as Fran's knowledge of the Spanish under 23 and junior <laughs> ranks is, I, I still will bet that I am the only one of the cycling podcast team oh. who has raced against one of the riders in the Vuelta Peloton this year. Eh? What about that? <laughs> That's amazing. When you say raced with, is that ra raced with? Well, I mean, you're doing air quotes there, Richard. <laughs> They'll work on My definition on of radio. raced is pinned on a number in the same event as this young man. Who is, who is that? Lionel? Well, it's the tallest it's not Henrik man Mass, in the race. Is it? No. We should be asking Fran this. Let, let's, let's adopt the same technique. Fran, who has Lionel raced, in inverted commas, with? Uh, I don't know. Patrick Lefebvre, maybe. <laughs> oh, that's hard. Patrick Lefebvre. <laughs> Lefebvre, we need the blooming police on this as well. <laughs> Patrick Lefebvre is about 61, I think. Oh, and yeah. uh, I'm, I'm not 61 yet. Um, that's, no, that's I gave a little hint there by saying he's the tallest man in the race. It's six foot eight. Connor Dunn, who's riding for the Aqua Blue team, he, like myself, is a... Is a does, well, he, does, he, does, he, Irish. does he know that he once raced with you? I don't know. It would be fascinating to ask. I'm yeah, sure he'd have some real memories. Might of find it, you might find it quite demoralizing. <laughs> the way that I ghosted around the peloton at the Hillingdon <laughs> cycle racing circuit in West London. Uh, I should point out, he was, I think, probably 16 or 17. He was riding for a, 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 a sort of a local racing team called Glendine. Um, he's from my neck of the woods. He, although he is, he is Irish, he grew up in Hertfordshire. Um, Something else you've got in common. We have. Uh, I'm not six foot eight. I'm also not riding the Vuelta, but just imagine how things could have been different if I had won that race. It's a sliding doors, a sliding doors moment, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> That's great. Well, um, you know, we're, we're going to wrap things up quite soon, but have some unfinished business from the Tour de France. Yeah, actually, we, can't which I, we can't finish on that. Which I, de no. <laughs> I, dealt, I dealt with. So unfinished business uh, from the Tour de France this morning. Uh, Fran, what was my unfinished business from the Tour de France? Uh, I think you didn't give uh, Thomas de Gain a pedal of the Champ Oh, he's better at this than we are. Uh, oh. That's correct. Yeah, Thomas de Gain lost out on the Combativity Award controversially. He was quite upset about it as well. Warren Barguil was given that award when Thomas de Gain was clearly the, the rider who was on, on the attack most often at the Tour. So he was a bit upset about that. And we decided uh, as a sort of consolation prize, if you can, it's more than a consolation oh. prize, isn't it? it? It probably overshadows the official Combativity Award. We decided to make him our overall peddler de charme for the Tour de France and uh, this morning I was able to deliver him a medium sized t-shirt sorry, sorry about that Thomas de Ghent um, but um, that's all, all I had uh, on me uh, so he's got a medium peddler de charme t-shirt he will definitely fit into it at least once he could wear it over several jumpers couldn't he <laughs> well they're, they're not they're not big these guys anyway um, he was delighted he was actually pleased to get it and uh, here's what he said this morning so Thomas congratulations on our being our peddler de charme from the the Tour de France, does that make up a little bit for the uh, not winning the, the Combativity Award at the Tour? Yeah, of course, it's, uh, it, w it was a disappointment not winning uh, the, the, the Combativity Award, but I'm over it now, so uh, already two days after the Tour I was looking forward to the Vuelta. And it's a jury, they can decide whatever they want, and it's, uh, Barguil also deserved the prize, so it's not, a, not really a problem. Uh, but. Uh, this this makes up makes up some things, yeah. You can wear that at home and uh, you know reflect on your very aggressive Tour de France. I mean, the tour doesn't seem that long ago. Um, how do you get yourself 
in shape? I mean, what do you do between the Tour and the Vuelta to, to, to keep the, the form and fitness you get from the Tour? The best thing you can do is rest a lot. I did a mistake two years ago by going on uh, altitude training camp and do a lot of uh, big trainings. That was a bit too much and I had the, the Vuelta was already, I was already done. So now I did uh, five criteriums. I only did some easy trainings of one and a half hour in between. And uh, after the, the, the fifth criterium was, uh, uh, I think, eight days after the, the tour. Then I went on training camp in Spain and only did, uh, I think, six trainings longer than f- three hours. So after a tour where you did three and a half thousand kilometers in three weeks, you don't uh, really need to uh, train your uh, base condition but just give your body some uh, a little bit of effort so the the body doesn't forget what to do in a, like in an attack or a, or a climb so I did that on the, the the smaller rides and just two trainings of more than five hours and all the rest was resting and do, can we expect to see you here on the attack again as you were at the tour is that is that what you're coming to the well to do get in breaks go for a stage win yeah, not as often as in the as in the tour, uh, but trying to go for uh, four or five uh, breakaways, and uh, hopefully it's the right day that I go. So that was Thomas again. Uh, you know, another reason for for playing that is is that he was finished quite a bit down today. Lost about seven minutes. It makes you wonder whether tomorrow might be one of the days he's earmarked. It is a stage that suits him. And when the Tour de France went up, the the climb they're going up at the end tomorrow, the Alto della Comella. Again, was first up the Camela in 2016 uh, when the Tour de France went up there. And it's a day that might definitely suit him. It's a stage that is lumpy and, you know, mountainous-ish, but it's very early in the race. And it reminds me a bit of, well, it doesn't remind me of the Etna stage, because the Etna stage was actually harder. Um, but there could be a similar kind of stalemate among the, the, the real favourites. I don't think we're going to see a, a really explosive day, and it could be a day for a breakaway. And a day for a breakaway is, of course, a day for Thomas to get. Before we finish up tonight, we should just mention, well, I think we want to mention that last night we were find ourselves in quite a surreal um, situation, dining in, in the centre of Nîmes, um, outside like thousands of other people were, when we began to pick up uh, news in inverted commas, on our phones of a terrorist incident in in Nîmes. And journalists were told to remain in the press room, which was near to the railway station, where apparently that was the focal point of the alleged terrorist activity. There was reports of uh, three armed men. Um, there was a report initially of one of the men being the uh, one of the one of the men involved in the a- attack in Barcelona a few days ago. There were all sorts of things were going well, were there firing were around. Of shots fired as well. Yeah. Um, and all of that, when uh, everything cleared up, all of that turned out not to be the case. And we, of course, sitting sort of 500 metres away from um, the press room and uh, sort of probably 650 metres away from the railway station, fairly concerned about what was unfolding, wondering what was happening. Um, and it was a real kind of eye-opener of just how quickly, uh, I don't want to use the phrase fake news, but just how quickly false news um, takes hold. And before we knew it, you know, British newspapers were reporting that Neem was in lockdown. Which and those was stories, when I last checked, are still are still there. And um, you know, lots of misreporting. And it, it it was yeah, it was quite sobering to realise how not you understand how rumours fire around Twitter, especially in social media. But you know, proper media, you know, news organisations running stories without clearly without having them checked properly. Well, yeah, particularly when it emerged this morning that the individual was not a terrorist, but was obviously a troubled individual who was um, who had some kind of uh, either a starter pistol type gun or a, an Im- imitation gun, and the police were taking no chances. Of course, there was a there were pictures of a very heavy police presence down by the railway station, but it was a real. As I say, it was a, you know I've been a journalist a long time, started out covering news stories, um, and just. You know, I've covered events in which people have sadly, you know, died. Incidents where people have sadly died, and you, you, it, it's strange to me that um, events of such gravity are reported without any kind of confirmation or, or fact checking. It was it was a real odd one, and and kind of well, it became the subject of our kind of late night round the dinner table discussion last well, this night. Is, this is unfortunately where the, our industry is, is letting itself down quite badly. Um, you know, the, the race to be first rather than the, late, the, 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 the far more important fact of being accurate is, is, 
is really um, not helping not helping anybody. Um, and yeah, it was it was quite alarming to to find ourselves in that situation and to to be reading stuff that was clearly not. Not the case. Uh, I mean, but I think the point was, at the time, we thought it might well, well be yeah, the case. Yeah, that ab- was the absolutely. Problem. But there were reports about, you know, Neem, the centre of Neem having been cleared and the police telling people to, to stay inside, etc. And that, that wasn't the case. I mean, I think working in cycling, we have seen, I've seen certainly rumours and stories spread and be accepted as fact when they're not. And you know that they're not. And, and the power of words in, you know, black and white, on a screen or on paper, they're very, very powerful and and, uh, and and difficult. As I say, those stories are still there. They're still on well, the Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Once it's all, uh, everything is kind of resolved and, and the facts of the, the matter are known, you know, there really should be some kind of cleaning up operation It's a draft of history of that, stuff, that yeah, remains. Yeah, exactly, a draft of history that really shouldn't, um, you know, shouldn't exist. And it's a, it's a really strange one, but um, not sure that the we on the Cycling Podcast necessarily have any answers t- as to how um, to change that. But it does bring it home that, you know, really journalism is about at least being sort of on the ground and trying to, um, you know, trying to piece together things, whether you're covering, um, you know, serious incidents or sport. I Unfortunately, guess. a lot of journalism now, um, due to budgets and, and lots of other things, is is monitoring social media. That's what passes as journalism a lot of the time, and it's very disappointing to see that in established media outlets. Well, without sounding flippant, I mean, the big danger, of course, when trying to cover a sporting event is if you fall asleep in the middle of the day and lis- lis- miss a lot of what has happened. Um, then you're, you're only going to get a 60% success rate. But we never up. do that. That uh, never happens. Unfortunately, you've got your fact checkers here with you, Lionel. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, let's wrap things up for tonight. Um, although we don't expect a major shootout between the GC riders tomorrow, Tandora, it's, it's another interesting stage and uh, looking forward to it. But that's all for tonight, I think. Thank you very much, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Fran. Thank you all. Thank you all.